Guys, we're about to go to New York and check out Tom Brady's memorabilia and watch auction. Money was no object to me today. I would bid up over $2 million for this watch. The person that buys it for 2.2, he can turn around and say, I want five. You want it there at the auction, therefore you want it, I'll take $5 million. And we've seen this happen before. These watches are insane. No pun intended, it would really be a touchdown if you guys could leave us a like, subscribe if you're not a subscriber, comment on the video, let me know your thoughts and share it with those that you feel would like this content. I'm super excited, I'm at Sotheby's. I was invited over by my friends to check out the famous, most talked about auction of the year, that's the Tom Brady auction. And I brought my friend Alex with me because when it comes to watches, I know a thing or two, when it comes to collectible, I figure why not bring the queen of collectibles with me, pun intended, right? Thanks for bringing me by, this is awesome. So you're gonna talk about all these jerseys and collectibles and yeah. the stories behind them. Well, I'm gonna talk about watches, so hopefully we'll learn off of each other for a little bit. We're gonna have a good time. The piece you need one, they estimated five to 600,000, that's going way over a million bucks. But they also agreed to give us collectibles, so. Early access to the GOAT, I'm excited. I'm gonna quickly go through and highlight some of the stuff. I'm gonna get your take on more of some of the vintage stuff, specifically the pocket watch, because you have more knowledge in that as far as me. I'm more of a modern guy. What I love mostly is how eclectic, and I know this is nearly not even remotely all of his collection. It's a small piece of it that he wants to give to the world to enjoy. The fact that you have IWCs, Richard Meal, Paul Newman's, Vintage Paddock, Pocket Watch. Like, I was super surprised to see the Pocket Watch. That was my biggest surprise. Tom did not shy away from Flex, right? You have you have an RM65 here. You have the latest Nadal. You have a Carbon TPT, RM1103. You have the Royal Oak. A little bit of bling. I mean, the Meteorite. This, the Meteorite Rolex. I mean, this bezel. I've always said to me, and this is actually not just me, it's also Adrian. He always says something about a baguette bezel on a Rolex versus just a round bezel. It's just, With the it's, meteorite. It, it it's, and and the meteorite, everything pops, the diamond meteorite dialing. And this is, you wanna talk about a flex watch? Obviously, Richard Meal is certainly flex pieces, but this is like next level. This is like the president. And the stone dials are in right now. They're huge. Of, of course. You also have, you know, a Batman, an offshore, an offshore on a bracelet, by the way. The brick. The brick, well, technically, this is, the newer brick, right? It's because a little lighter. It's a little bit lighter, but it's still one of the heavier ones, not because the latest ones are actually lighter, and the issue was is this watch was always heavy. I'm super biased, AP is my favorite brand. They try so. to make it a little bit more comfortable to wear it every day, but it's still a brick. Yeah, tell me about it, it is, it's definitely a brick. I'm gonna skip over the main event, I'm gonna ju just jump to IWCs, and honestly, I've always loved I IWC. It's, it has been one of those brands that's near and dear to my heart. Very military style watches, obviously pilot style watches. So to me, I've always liked the Top Guns. Of course, one of the most iconic perpetual systems created by Klaus way back when. Uh, and I still feel that in today's watch world, people ask me, hey, I want to deal, the value. I want to value. The value behind an IWC perpetual calendar is second to none, I think. It's unmatched. I think close to second probably Jaeger or JJ Lecoultre, yeah. I think may come close second because the minute you start jumping out to other brand, you're paying buku dollars. and. Again, the Portuguese Perpetual is one of my favorites as well as the Top Gun Perpetual. And honestly, any of the Top Guns, the seven day power reserve. This is another watch, if you wanna talk about value in a precious metal, this is a watch that you pick up in comparison to other brands, the amount of value that you get with these is absolutely insane. Personal, the layout of the dial is beautiful, look at it. So personal note, and this is, this is what I've always said, what I like to buy at IWC, if you look at the, power, the seven day power reserve or the Perpetual, there's virtually no bezel. And what happens is, the concentration is on the dial, as you just said. The dial absolutely pops. The case design, the way it's done with literally virtually no bezel, the attention is to the watch, to the complications. And the exhibition case backs for the movements you can see. And exactly, and it's a big exhibition back. Again, virtually no border around it. This is amazing stuff. Uh, take a look at the petite prints. Wow. I mean, Cam, look what's in the back. There's gonna be a bidding war over this one. Let's move in some of the vintage stuff before we get to the grand finale. Tell me about this. 3970 first series. What's special about this is it's a perpetual calendar, chronograph, but if you look at the movement number in our cataloging, it's 001, which is the second one off the production line. 3970s, we saw, we saw them you know, early in your career. We saw those go through the roof leading up to the 08 crisis. And then post that, they kind of died down. Peak, and peak, drop. And then it dropped big time. And, I, and I'm still biting my elbows for not picking up certain versions of this in different metals. I remember there was a platinum one out there for like no money. And I'm like, eh, well, nobody really wants these. And something in the back of my head said, buy for yourself. And I didn't. And now 3970s have shot through they the roof once up. again. And I think this is going to, what's the estimate on this? Uh, 150 to 250. Okay, so I'm going to set the over under, I'm going to say over 400. And it should. If it, One recently just sold it in Geneva for over 200 at the yeah. moment. So we see that 3970s are finally coming back up. Yeah. Yeah, but that's serial number. Well, zero, zero, 001. 
Yeah, I mean, that's, that's insane. Jumbo Nautilus, two-tone? So two-tone, 3,700. I think big value on the market today is on 3,700s in general. If you look at steel, if you look at gold, if you look at two-tone, they've come down in price post the Nautilus hype during COVID. Because and it's the perfect size to be on a 42 millimeter. The condition is, is, is absolutely insane. Whoever was selling her watches, I've been noting the condition on both watches, actually. If you look at the whole collection, the condition is amazing. Tell me about this pocket watch. because oh, My favorite. So the estimate is two to 400,000. Look at the condition. It's a I perpetual mean, calendar. Split second minute repeater. That's amazing. Now, Music to our ears. Oh, this is also Tiffany. Oh, just subtle flex. Subtle. 1917. Well, you know, it's, it's funny. Like, I expect these type of things from Sotheby's because this is the type of stuff that they get. My question to you in general, I had, a, I had a couple of guys reach out to me on Instagram. They asked me about my thoughts on pocket watches coming back. And I've always said that I think part of the reasons of where pocket watches kind of died down, while they were still hot not so long ago, it's part of the reason they died out is because a lot of the collectors died. Yeah. Uh, but now the question becomes is how do you get in the young generation to understanding the importance of pocket watches in general, the one that started off going all the way back to 1525 to Germany, the, the, what is it, the drum pocket watch that they made, to masterpieces such as this. Do you think that this auction and the fact that this pocket watch is in here and that pocket watch belonged to Tom Brady is going to open up the attention to some of the younger generation to say, oh, maybe pocket watches can be a flex because that's the biggest issue. You can't flex a pocket watch. No, but you see a lot of people are doing it with lapels right now and other things. But if you remember, because of pocket watches, timepieces are what they are right now. Of course. Before it was when we first started, people used to just deal only in pocket watches. Timepieces were like secondary. Finally, there was a shift, and during that shift, you started seeing people going to wristwatches, which is amazing for now, but back in the day, pocket watches were everything, minute repeaters, you could see grand comps. It's just the sheer beauty how they were doing things back in 1917. With the machinery that they had back in the day, if you look at the movement, it will get a movement shot, you'll see the beauty, the craftsmanship. I believe like if you're a true collector at some point, you have to gravitate to a pocket watch. So let's talk about this Daytona and then we'll move on to the grand finale. So we all know this is a Paul Newman JPS, the color combo gold and black. But what's so special about it is if you look at the condition of this, and yeah. it happened to be Tom's. When he was inducted into the Patriots Hall of Fame, he actually wore that during the ceremony and just look at the condition. You can take it off there. I mean, this is just, I mean. And it's also a 14 karat case made for the Americas which is, to me, more rare than the 18 carat cases. Uh, would you say known? <laughs> Throw a number of how many of these are known? We keep, like, you'll talk to the European dealers, they'll tell you X, and then you talk to the American dealers because we happen to see more of them. Right. From my point of view, there's just less known made in 14 carat because at that point, all the bigger watches were in Europe, not in the Americas. People always ask me if you had to get a grail timepiece uh, from vintage Rolex, this would be the watch I would go for, 14 karat well, JPS. Well, you could start with a pre-Daytona 6238, 6239. No, I'm talking about like grail. This, is, yeah, this, this is the ultimate grail. And again, the minute, now that you're adding provenance to and name Tom Brady to these timepieces, I, I personally said, and I said this earlier in the room, is the crossover from the world of collectibles and the world of horology, it's going to mix with this auction. By you putting this auction together, you did a wonderful job. You literally colliding two huge markets together into one. Let's go to the grand finale. So this is the watch that people saw him wearing on the roast, and a lot of the people that were speculating you know, what was actually on a dial before they knew. When's the last time you saw a manufacturer allow a client to do a collaboration to actually put their name on the dial? Never. And it was because he, Tom happened to work with Michael Friedman, they came up with this idea, and it was just for Francois, and it's just like a perfect marriage. Like, it's, it's unique. So, you know, you know I'm, uh, I'm super biased when it comes to Audemars. It's my favorite brand, always has been. I've always, I actually just talked about this morning about the new cause that they did. Yeah. I think it's an amazing timepiece, right? Royal Oak, the greatest blank canvas. And this just goes to show. Guilherme dial, salmon. Guilherme salmon dial, and you're talking about baguette markers. That This is going to be the one that's going to bring all the big bidders into the room because... I can't think of a bigger flex than having a Royal Oak Turbion with a baguette bezel that says Tom Brady on it with baguettes. I just, I can't, I can't think, I, can't, I think with this one, I've, and I've seen so much stuff that has gone through your auction most recently. What's your prediction? So the auction estimate is four to 800,000. It's below retail technically. So four to $800,000, my prediction, I would set the over under at 2 million, I would take the over. That would be like, if I, if money was no object to me today, I would bid up over $2 million for this watch, personally. The person that buys it for 2.2, .2, he can turn around and say, I want five. You weren't there at the auction, you didn't buy it. Therefore, you want it? 
I'll take $5 million, and we've seen this happen before. Again, first of all, thank you so much for letting me into this room, letting me hold this stuff. I think this is going to be one of the most amazing collections to date. The, again, the fact that you combine two worlds together, the world of collectibles, the world of watches, which is also technically a world of collectibles, if you will. There's lots of watch collectors out there. Thank you for coming. I just want to say that the sale is December 10th. 7 p.m., but before that, it's luxury week here at Sotheby's. Please stop by if you're in New York so you can see all the categories. We still have our important watches sale that's going to go on December uh, 6 to 10 a.m., and then followed by our online sale that is from November 27th to the 13th. And we'll link all that stuff below, guys, in the video. Richard, again, thank you so much. Always, thank always you. a pleasure to see you, brother. One of the amazing things about this sale is that we have a jersey from each of the bowl games throughout his, his college career. So this is from the 1997 Rose Bowl. Um, Tom was actually backing up Brian Greasy at the time, um, <laughs> which is incredible to think about Tom Brady as a backup quarterback. Um, but this is one of the earliest artifacts from Tom's competitive football career. Um, and you can see that it looks a little bit different than the jerseys that we know today, right? I it's mean, got you're this... kidding me. I've, <laughs> yeah. never, I've seen a lot of jerseys in my time, and I've never seen one. I've never seen a college jersey from the 90s. Yeah, you can see it's cut up. It's got, you know, cropped... Um, midriff and, and sleeves. And, this, and it's yeah, the sleeves are not tailored. This part is not tailored. Is this is this like a classic thing as well in the 90s? You know, this is the only jersey of his that we have this, uh, you know, extra V-neck there for. Um, but I think... Really? Yeah. I, so I love that. I love that jersey. I'm sure a lot of ladies would agree if I could wear that with like a pair of leggings to a club. <laughs> that thing is cool. Yeah. You know what I love the most about this? The roses on the sleeves. The Rose Bowl is the most iconic like college football stadium in my opinion and um, college football championship game in in my opinion and the roses just take it next level yeah and and the blue and gold from um the wolverines is just iconic for those of you that don't know alex she was on a netflix show king of collectibles and of course I myself dubbed her the queen of collectibles. What about this thing over here? So in addition to the jersey uh, that Tom broke the all-time career passing yards record in, we also have um, his 100,000 uh, yard jersey here. Um, he's the only quarterback ever in NFL history to reach 100,000 um, passing yards in his career. And this is just an amazing milestone that no one will likely ever uh, reach again. He played 23 seasons, as you know. Check out the detailing on the 12 here. Obviously, he either got sacked there or maybe rubbed off his dirty fingers. And I just think that's what makes game used jerseys the coolest. We want, we want messy. We want, we want, this is like one of the rare things in life that we want messy and collectibles. Yeah. We want jerseys to look like they've been worn and magic has been made in them and this obviously look at that grass stain <laughs> he definitely got sacked here and he landed on that right, right shoulder pretty cool yeah the, these are Left the shoulder. things that make <laughs> you know items like this really unique in addition to the jersey there's the football that he actually throw through to pass that hundred thousand uh yard career plateau you know what does it feel like to you rome I'm feeling greatness. Yeah. I, feel, I, feel, I feel like I need to rub some of this off on me yeah. because I'm literally feeling greatness all of this ball. This is Tom Brady's helmet from his time with the Bucks. Um, it's been matched to five games, including games where he broke um, the Bucks single season passing yards record and a bunch of other accolades. Um, it's a really incredible piece. Things like this really never come to auction. Mm -mm. Um, we're looking at you know very rare pieces from Tom Brady's personal collection, um, and uh, this is just an amazing piece from the last chapter of his career. Yeah, and the fact <laughs> that he wore it five times is pretty incredible. It yeah. is way heavier than you would think because I think the QB helmets are heavier in Rome because they put the microphones in there. Also, we got to protect those heads. Guys, comment below. Price aside, Tom Brady's watch or Tom Brady's helmet? Comment below. If I have the money, which I don't, to buy an <laughs> item of this historical significance, I am somehow, some way asking Brady to sign that. Yeah. That would take the value up even more, like tremendously. 
Um, but that's something, if you are a buyer in this, if you're in that situation, that's something to think about, right? Because the value of this could only go up. You've met with the guy a few times, so maybe you make a phone call. <laughs> I mean, it depends who's buying. Are you buying? After all of that, me and Alex decided to take a stroll through Sotheby's, and you know that banana that blew up the internet that fetched, what, $6 million? Well, we got to see that the day before. What is up with the banana tape to the wall? Well, this, this literally broke the internet when he displayed it Art Basel, and then actually somebody ended up moving it, and there was like a whole scandal because people thought this was a joke and it actually was a piece of art. So it's for real. It's a banana taped to a wall with a piece of duct tape. This broke Instagram, Facebook, and every but other But how social. old is the banana? Well, they, they change it out. But the idea is that this is something he did, this is something that belonged to him, what? and it's estimated one to two million dollars. Wait, what? So you're paying for a piece of duct tape then? But you're, pay you're paying for a piece of history kind of thing. But is it the I know, same? I know is that a, a man, I know that I know that a man landing on the moon is and getting his boots is probably a little bit more iconic than a banana tape to a wall. I don't know. Wall. This one but I it's, don't get. It's, I, it's, <laughs> it's based. It's literally based on the number of eyes and what it created and what it did in the industry. You can read about it right out there. But it's not even tangible because you you change the banana out because they obviously yeah, rot. It's the same piece of duct tape. Right? Is it the same? Sa it can't be the same piece of duct tape. That's My only question is: is like whoever buys it, do they cut the piece of wall out? You know. <laughs> If I had to pick one item in this entire building, this would, be, this would be it. You want to talk about the ultimate collectible item for me as a personal individual, this would be it. Yeah, it's so a Michael Schumacher driven Ferrari, five victories. And he's the OG GOAT before Lewis he, Hamilton. He is, he's still a GOAT, right? right? I mean, this is when Formula One racing was a little bit more dangerous. Notice, remember there's, the no bar, there's no bars. That's right. When you climbed into my car, that had a halo. This doesn't have a halo. So uh, if he flipped it, if that did no, flip, but there, how but, did they, but, how but, were they But they protected? were so strapped in with the helmet, plus you have that thing that protects So that you. thing at the, the fit. Exactly, exactly. Okay. So to me, this is the ultimate collectible. Where did like, you guys get this from? Do, you, do we know? Like, like, was this... Probably from his estate, I would imagine. Like, from his family. Yeah. That's I mean, this is, this is, this is, this is Ferrari. So what is this This is for? Schumacher. Uh, was there an estimate put on this? Are you are you in the are you in the bidding or no, what? I can't afford this. <laughs> I, I know. I, the last the last Schumacher car I was looking at at Arnhem Sotheby's went for twelve and a half million pounds. A Formula One car, not any Formula One car, but Michael Schumacher's Ferrari Formula One car. I know that the last Michael Schumacher Ferrari fetched over twelve million dollars in auctions, and I would expect the same result for this. If somebody told me money was no object, I love Tom Brady. I would love to own his helmet. I would love to own his watch. But I would take that Schumacher car all day every day over any of the stuff that we saw today. Not only would I spend a lot of money for that car, if it went in the realm that I can afford, I would probably give my left kidney for it. That's all for today, and last but not least, once again, every single subscriber, every comment, every like, every share counts in our video. So I would really appreciate it if you enjoyed this video, you do all of those things for us to help this channel to continuously grow and bring us and bring new eyes into the space.